All right, let's uh, dive into this world of credit default swaps. You know, CDS for those prepping for the CFA Level 2 exam. Absolutely. And we're going deep, not just skimming the surface. Love that. So CDS, what are they really? Like for someone who's maybe uh, still getting it to speed. Think of it like insurance. But instead of a house or car, you're insuring against a company defaulting on its debt. Okay, so I buy a CDS. And if the company you know, goes under, I get a payout. Exactly. You're transferring the credit risk to the seller who's basically taking that risk for those regular payments, like an insurance premium. So there's always a buyer and a seller. But what about the actual debt? Is it tied to a specific bond? Yeah, there's what's called the reference obligation, typically a bond from the company. And the reference entity is the company itself, the one whose credit worthiness we're looking at. So if I buy CDS on, say, Company X, it's based on one specific bond they've issued. Right. And while it's usually a senior unsecured bond, the CDS actually covers any debt ranked equal or higher. Hold on. Even though it's based on one bond, it covers a broader range of their debt. That's right. And here's where it gets interesting. The buyer can deliver the cheapest to deliver obligation. They choose the lowest priced bond that fits the CDS criteria. Oh, that sounds like the buyer could um, maximize their payout that way. Exactly. Say company X has multiple bonds. If a credit event happens, the CDS buyer can deliver the cheapest one that qualifies, even if it wasn't the original. Okay, so that's strategic. All right, we've got the buyer, the seller, the reference obligation. What makes someone get a payout? That's triggered by a credit event, not just any financial trouble. It's specific, predefined in the contract. So like uh, bankruptcy would be one? Bankruptcy, for sure. But also failure to pay, pretty straightforward and restructuring where the debt terms significantly change. So who decides if that's happened? Is it just like opinion? Not at all. It goes to the ISDA Determinations Committee. They're key for objectivity and consistency. A whole committee. Wow, that's official. It is. These decisions are a big deal for the market, so it has to be clear and unbiased. They analyze, review the contract, and vote on whether a credit event happened. Makes sense. So let's say it does happen. Does the buyer literally get a stack of defaulted bonds? That's physical settlement, but it's not the usual way. Most common is cash settlement. So cash instead of the bond. How's that amount figured out? It's based on the loss given default, or LGD. That's the percentage of debt you're expected to lose if there's a default. LGD, okay, but how do you know what that percentage is? Seems like it could be all over the place. Right. That's why there's usually an auction to set the recovery rate, which then gives you the LGD. This makes the payout standardized, even if the actual recovery later is different. So even if you recover more than expected, the CDS payout stays fixed. Exactly. So understanding that auction process and how LGD works is key for the exam. Got it. Now, CDS pricing, what all goes into that? Well, like many things in finance, there are two legs, protection and premium. Protection leg is the payment if a credit event happens. Premium leg is the regular payments from buyer to seller, those insurance-like premiums. Is there a set formula for this, or does it totally depend on the contract? There's a framework, but it's not one size fits all. One big concept is the upfront premium. This is paid when the contract starts, and it's based on the difference between the credit spread and the standard CDS coupon. So it's adjusting for the fact that not all companies with the same credit rating are actually equally risky? Precisely. Think of it as fine-tuning the price to match what the market thinks of that specific company. And that leads us to the credit curve. Right, where we see CDS spreads for different lengths of time, like a yield curve, but with credit risk mixed in. You got it. That curve tells us a lot about how the market sees that company's risk over time. So an upward curve usually means they think the default risk gets bigger further out in the future. That's the typical reading. But you can have downward curves or ones with bumps or inversions, each meaning something different about the company's credit worthiness. So knowing how to read those curves is important for anyone working with CDS. Absolutely. Not just for market sentiment, but for spotting trading opportunities, too. Speaking of trading, that's where it gets complex, right? And maybe a little controversial. You're right. You've got investors using CDS to manage their current credit exposure, hedging against potential losses on bonds they already have. So protection for what they already own. Exactly. But then there are those taking naked positions. That means buying or selling CDS protection without owning the debt itself. Ah, that's the controversial part. Betting on the company without actually being involved. It's definitely been debated, especially after 2008. Some say it's just speculation and it can mess things up. Others say it adds liquidity and helps figure out the right prices. It's complicated with good points on both sides. But for us, it's important to understand how those different motivations can affect the whole CDS market. For sure. And speaking of different strategies, have you heard of basis trading? The name rings a bell, but not exactly how it works. Something about um, price differences between bonds and CDS, right? You're on the right track. Sometimes the two markets show levels of risk for the same company, 
and that gap can mean profit for traders. So if bonds look riskier than the CDS, you'd buy the bond and also buy CDS protection. That's one way called a negative basis trade. You're betting that the prices will eventually even out, closing that gap. So you're not betting on the company itself, but on whether those two markets are pricing things correctly. Exactly. You're going after that inefficiency. But remember, it's not risk-free. The prices could move further apart, too. Right. No free lunch. This has been helpful. I'm seeing how these CDS concepts could show up on the CFA exam. For sure. And we're just getting started. Next time, we'll dig into specific strategies, look at real examples, even touch on how ESG factors are changing things. Sounds good. I'm ready. So last time we talked about hedging bond positions using CDS. Can we get into an example of that? Sure. Let's say you're managing a portfolio and you've got exposure to the energy sector. You like the sector long term, but you're a little iffy about one company specifically. Maybe they're vulnerable to some upcoming environmental regulations or something. So you're like bullish on energy overall, but not so much on that one company. Exactly. So you could buy CDA protection on just that company. That way, if their credit takes a hit from those regulations, the CDS payout would offset losses in your bond portfolio. Ah, so you're still in the sector but you've lowered the risk from that one company. Right. Now, let's switch gears to those naked CDS positions. Remember, this is where it can get a little um, controversial. Yeah, where you're betting on credit without owning the debt. Can you give a real-world example of how that might be used strategically? Okay, imagine you're an analyst, and you're deep into two tech companies that compete. You've done your research, and you think one's going to blow the other out of the water. Maybe they've got a killer product coming out. So you see a market share shift, and that could affect both companies' credit? Exactly. You could act on that by buying CDS protection on the company you think will lose out, figuring their credit spread will widen, and at the same time, sell CDS protection on the winner, expecting their spread to narrow. Oh, interesting. So you're playing the difference between them making money if the spreads move apart like you think. You got it. It's a way to use your research and make a bet on how those two companies will do relative to each other. Now, we touched on curve trades last time. Could you give an example of how someone would play those anticipated changes in the curve shape? Sure. Let's say a company is doing a big restructuring. You think it'll be good for them long term, but there will be some bumps in the road, some uncertainty while it's happening. So short term risk goes up but then down later as the restructuring works out. Exactly. You could express that view with a curve steepening trade. Buy CDS protection on a shorter maturity, say two years, and sell protection on a longer one, maybe five or 10 years. So if you're right and the curve steepens, meaning that short-term CDS spread gets wider faster, you profit. Exactly. It's about having an opinion on how the company's credit will change over different timeframes. Okay, this is making it all much clearer, how you can really use CDS strategically. Now, I'm curious about basis trading. Can you give a specific example? Of course. Let's say you're looking at a company and their five-year bond is yielding 6%. You break that down, taking out the risk-free rate and their funding spread, and you see a credit spread of 3%. So you've isolated the part of the yield that's purely for credit risk. Right. Then you check the five-year CDS on that same company, and it's trading at a 2.5% spread. Aha. Uh -huh. The CDS is saying lower risk than the bond market. That's negative basis, right? You got it. Now you have to decide who do you believe more, the bond market or the CDS market. If you think the bond market is too pessimistic, you might go for that negative basis. So you buy the bond and buy CDS protection too. Exactly. You're now set up the gain if those spreads come closer together. If that difference in how they see the risk goes away, you make money. It's like uh, arbitraging the pricing between those two markets. Good way to put it. But it's not a sure thing. Those spreads might not converge. They could even get wider apart, meaning losses. Right. Always got to remember the risk. Absolutely. So you need good analysis. You need to really understand how bonds and CDS work together to do basis trading well. This is all really helpful, these examples. It's amazing how much you can do with CDS, all the different strategies. They're powerful tools, that's for sure. And understanding them is a big step towards nailing that credit risk part of the CFA Level 2 exam. Right. Speaking of the exam, can we connect all this to the curriculum specifically? What should people focus on to be prepared? Of course, in our last segment, we'll get into scenarios that are right out of the CFA Level 2 material. We'll look at how CDS might be used in leveraged buyouts and how to incorporate ESG factors into your decisions. That'll help connect the dots between the theory and the real-world stuff you might see on the exam. Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay, so we're looking at how these CDS concepts play out in the real world, stuff that might be on the CFA Level 2 exam. Right. Let's focus on leveraged buyouts and uh, and how to think about ESG factors when you're making investment decisions. All right. LBOs first. Lots of debt involved in those, which obviously affects the credit risk. So where does CDS fit in? Let's say a company is about to be bought out in an LBO. They're taking on a bunch of new debt to make it happen. That pushes up their leverage. And usually people see that as a higher chance of default. 
So you'd expect their CDS spread to widen once the LBOs announce when everyone knows how much debt they're taking on. Yeah, that's what you'd usually see. Smart investors who see that coming, they might buy CDS protection before the announcement. That drives up the price of the protection, making the spread wider. So it's not just about protecting what you own. It's also about making a bet on how that risk will change. Exactly. Got to stay ahead of the game. That's really interesting. Now, let's talk ESG. Environmental, social, governance, those are getting super important for investors these days. How does CDS come into that? This is a hot topic right now. Imagine you're comparing two companies in the same industry. One's got a great ESG record. The other's had some uh, some issues maybe with environmental stuff or how they run the company. I'm guessing the one with the bad ESG probably has a higher CDS spread, right? Because of that extra risk. That's the usual thinking, yeah. People want to be paid more to insure against the risk from a company that's not doing well in ESG. So you could go long short based on that, right? Buy protection on the bad ESG company, sell it on the good one. Exactly. That's how some investors are putting their ESG principles into action. If the market agrees with you that spread difference gets bigger, you make money. So it's not just about managing risk. It's also about maybe pushing companies to be better. The good ones get rewarded, the bad ones get punished. It's a powerful argument, for sure. CDS aren't just numbers on a screen. They can actually help make things better. That's a great point. Wow, this whole deep dive has been really eye-opening. I feel like I get CDS now, how they work, the different things you can do with them, how they connect to the bigger picture in finance. Glad to hear it, but don't forget they are complex. Get the basics down, really dig into the details, and you'll be set for those CFA questions. You've definitely made me feel more ready to tackle them. Just remember, practice makes perfect. Do those practice problems, think through different situations, don't be afraid to really challenge yourself. The more you work with it, the better you'll understand it. Great advice. Well, this has been an amazing journey into the world of CDS. I started out clueless. And now I feel like I've learned a ton and I'm much better prepped for that CFA exam. I'm happy to hear that. And keep in mind, the learning never stops. Keep digging, keep asking questions, keep pushing yourself to really get it. Who knows, maybe someday you'll be the CES expert helping others through this stuff. Thanks for being with us on this deep dive into CDS. We hope this helps you with your CFA studies and in your career. Until next time, happy study and never stop learning.